It really is true. When you choose a surgery residency, it affects everybody. E-shadowing session one with Dr. Michael Galvez. How are you doing today? Doing great, man. Doing great. I'm excited that uh, you decided to take the leap with me. Come be be guest number one on e-shadowing. We have almost 1,600 people here live with us right now. So thank you for taking the time to educate them on your profession as a plastic and reconstructive surgeon, a hand, a hand surgeon um, as, as part of that. So I, I appreciate you taking your time here. Why don't we uh, give a little bit, I, I love asking this question, so I'm gonna keep it here with, uh, with, with this question. When did you realize you wanted to be a physician? When I could, when I could actually feel that it was possible. And that was when I transferred to Berkeley. Um, I could feel that I was taking classes with other students that were al also interested in medicine. And so in community college, I always had this doubt, but when I got to Berkeley, I was like, maybe I can actually do this. This is what I wanna do. Nice, that's awesome. So as a plastic and reconstructive surgeon, talk to me about a day in the life What's that? Sure. Like? So, yeah, and that's that's what I'm going to go through a little bit through the presentation is yeah. um, when you think of plastic surgeon, it's no one's fault, but you think of cosmetic plastic surgery. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Miami. <laughs> that's, that? Dr. That, that's Dr. Miami's fault. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, one, one of many. Um, there's many different d different doctors. Some are doing great jobs. Some are um, are very. Um, just uh, a little bit flamboyant and um, showing off the the fun side sometimes, but sometimes it can be a little over the top for sure. Yeah. Well, very cool. Well, I'm excited. You you came super prepared, so I'm ready for you to just jump right in and, and go into your presentation. For the students watching this, this is obviously our first session. We have almost 1,700 people here right now. Let me just give a little bit of nuts and bolts of of e shadowing and what that entails just to kind of cover some 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 bases here so the the e shadowing sessions are being recorded uh, everyone gets a replay link tomorrow morning uh whether you attended live or not you'll get a replay link as long as you registered both the live session and the replay session is checking attendance and you have to be here at least 45 minutes combined live and or replay to get credit for the session. We'll also be sending out a quiz tomorrow morning with the replay link uh, to be able to, you'll have to be able to pass the quiz, four out of five questions, it shouldn't be too hard. You can only take the quiz once, I, it's just an executive decision that I made. Uh, we're all pre-meds or you are all pre-meds, Do Dr. Galvez and myself, we, we've been through this process, we're professional test takers. Um, so one one time for the, the, the test, and then when you're done with e-shadowing, you don't wanna come anymore, you want your certificate, we'll give you a certificate with all of those hours that you've accumulated. So uh, we'll take care of you. If you go to eshadowing.com, that'll take you now to my main website instead of just the registration page. And there's a bunch of FAQ on there and we'll update that as we get more questions. So nuts and bolts out of the way, let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, Perfect. Thank you everyone for coming. I think this is an awesome opportunity to really share what people do besides um, going on YouTube and trying to find something that fits. Um, I think it's great that you're finding real physicians uh, that are in practice. And so um, I'm a plastic surgeon and I'm a hand surgeon. I love this picture because it shows, it shows the family member holding the child. It shows the child giving their hand uh, to the hand surgeon who's the hand surgeon who's thinking about how can I make this better? How can I make this child's hand better? And so I'm a plastic and reconstructive surgeon. I'm also a hand surgeon. I'll, I'll speak about that a little later. And I focus on treating children with plastic surgery and hand problems. And I work at a hospital in the Central Valley. It's called Valley Children's. And this is just from a pamphlet I have, but I see a lot of different diagnoses that children can have, whether it's trauma, whether it's congenital, uh, whether they're born with it, uh, whether they've had injuries. And so um, those are one of the many things that I do. And so what is a plastic surgeon? 
And it's funny, I have a picture of a water bottle here because when I first met a plastic surgeon, I was shadowing actually, and I was holding a plastic bottle and I asked the plastic sur surgeon, like plastic, like this plastic bottle, I, I just had no idea. I was like, are they making people's face out of plastic? Cause it kind of looks like that. <laughs> um, and so um, it, that was my serious initial dumb question. Um, but it's true. Most people don't know. And so, you know, when you think of plastic surgery, you think of shows like botched, you think of Dr. Nazarian show skin decision. These are actual shows that are showing a little hint about what plastic surgery is about. Um, and so these are newer generation shows, which I, I like how they show both the patient's perspective and things that can happen after, but these are really focused on cosmetic and aesthetic surgery. So what is plastic? What is a plastic surgeon? And plastic is derived from the Greek word plastikos, like silly putty. Um, it's moldable. And so the history of plastic surgery, this is one of the first plastic surgeons, Dr. Taglio Kazi from um, Italy. And at the time, there were many, um, many patients that had nasal nose deformities. And so a way that he figured out to treat that deformity um, which a lot of people at the time thought is an act of God, um, or maybe he was working against uh, an act of God was by treating it, doing surgery and what he did. And you can see just that little um, piece of tissue from the arm, he connected to the nose and he let it stay there for about three weeks and then divided that piece of tissue from the arm and that tissue that was connected would survive. Um, and so what do plastic surgeons treat? We treat patients from head to toe it's uh, really, w w these are things that we like to, to say as plastic surgeons, but we're a surgeon surgeon. What that means is other surgeons, cardiac surgeons, general surgeons, when they have a tough problem, they ask us, how can we help them? And we fo focus on not only the form of what things look like, but also the function. And so um, this is a stack of, of one of the main plastic surgery volumes from Nelligan, um, and it has many different subjects. Um, and it's, I mean, just one of those subjects alone within plastic surgery, like one of those volumes is over a thousand pages. Um, and it's almost, it's taller than me. This is a life-size model of me, um, <laughs> and the amount of content you can see. And so just going through those volumes. So you have the principles of plastic surgery, which I'll be going through, um, the aesthetics, uh, cranial facial trauma, cleft lip and palate. Uh, cranial facial um, uh, deformities. Um, and then the other volumes include lower extremity, trunk, burns. There's a whole volume on breast reconstruction for patients that have breast deformities or breast cancer, and then hand and upper extremity, which is what I am. And so who needs plastic surgery? This is a quote from one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Uh, James Chang, which is plastic surgery happens to the unlucky. So think of trauma, think of bad infections, think of cancer, think of congenital deformities. And so you really wanna be wary about what you see on social media because it usually doesn't truly depict the, uh, the field well. Um, and yes, there's the aesthetic component, but it's really, um, I think sessions like this and seeing shadowing uh, physicians in real life, you know, way down the line in the future after this pandemic is, is, is really important. And that's why I think this is such a great opportunity. And so, I'm gonna transition about what it takes to be a plastic surgeon. Uh, this is my story. Um, I say 30th grade because I did community college, um, Berkeley, two years of research, and then uh, medical school and residency. And so I just have another um, quick, this is gonna be a really quick presentation on uh, how do you become a plastic surgeon? Cause it's also something that I get a lot of questions from mentees and how, how I got there. And so it's not easy. And no one ever said it was going to be easy. It's a surgical field. And so it requires a lot of dedication. And you definitely want to have a backup if this is a field that you're that you want to pursue. And so shadowing, e-shadowing, mentorship, um, it's amazing. And I'll go through this later. But even the plastic surgery residencies are taking on social media as a new generation of recruiting the next generation of their field. They're using social media. And so um you want to figure out where you fit in. And, and to be a good doctor, um, it's not about just being a good surgeon and being skilled. It's You have to be able to communicate well with people. Uh, your 
it's a huge responsibility to take that on to whether even if you're doing aesthetic surgery, you're trying to make somebody look better than what they already look like, or you're trying to reconstruct somebody from an injury. So you want to have knowledge and the skill, obviously, as well. And if you want to do it, you can do it. And let I me mean ask you that, a, a, let me ask you a question that came in yeah, that, that I think is relevant to where we are right now. Yeah. And that's that's the fear around like, am I good enough? to to literally cut someone open and put them back together i think that is a common thing that any surgeon constantly struggles with because whether you're a medical student whether you're in training whether you're actually in practice like myself is you're trying to treat patients with really hard problems and so by being well prepared by being well trained you can hopefully anticipate any problems that do come up. Um, and I, I, I think it's always a question is, as soon as you make an incision is, am I making this right incision? Is this going to be the right approach? And so you build that confidence over time. And a whole other lecture would be on, um, on imposter syndrome, right? And it's, it's your, as medical, I can tell you that any human with two hands as a hand surgeon can train how to use them to help people, to fix things, to be a carpenter, to be a surgeon. It's its very doable. We have a lot, assuming that there isn't a huge functional deformity, um, but if you have the hands, and I'm gonna talk about this at the end of the lecture, um, and you have um, the knowledge and the heart for it, you know, you can really make a difference. So I, I do, I think if you believe it and you, you shoot for it and you have mentorship and what I'm gonna go through right now, I, I think it's possible. Yeah. And so, but it is competitive. And so you want to get into a top medical school. And the reason for that, it just comes with, it comes down to opportunity. And that's what I talk a lot about is some of that opportunity you can be born with, right? With socioeconomic differences, but some of that, even a simple medical school can make a difference where I was lucky to be at Stanford. I literally walked a block over to do research in plastic surgery. It was literally that easy for me to do that. And whereas if you're going to another medical school that doesn't have plastic surgery, you have to travel, you know, miles to get or even another state to get um, to be able to do research in that. And so um, that is I think that's important. You want to do well on your boards, which is changing now. I know uh, research is important. Shadowing is important because you want to make sure it's the right fit. It's a big commitment, six to seven years. Um, so mentorship's important and there's no cookie cutter approach. It's not like do well on your boards and you're going to be a great plastic surgeon. I've seen it. People do really well on their boards and then they end up dropping out after a couple of years because it wasn't the right fit. And so it really is a match. Um, can a DO become a plastic surgeon? Absolutely. Um, I definitely have seen some awesome, any type of surgeon, honestly. Um, but you have to, again, it comes down to opportunity. You have to go out of your way to find a mentor and you can make it possible. And so there are two main tracks. One is it's called the independent model, which is really doing general surgery first um, and then doing a fellowship. So that's a really long time. That's almost that's 10 years. And then the integrated model, which is what I did, which is probably the most common way. Um, and that can be anywhere from six to seven years of residency after medical school. And I did five years of medical school because I did a year of research within medical school. And so surgical residency, first year's intern. Um, there are the other years in residency, you get graduated responsibility, you do rotations in different settings. Um, and so it, it's tough though, residency in surgery, you start before six sometimes, you end late in the evening, right? You round in the morning on your patients, you do surgeries, and then you round on them in the evening, you check on them. And so the call is challenging. Uh, there's a lot of learning, teaching didactics, conferences, hands-on workshops, the operations can be from simple to super complex. Um, you do yearly exams and really with any residency you're considering, it's the best years of your life, right? Uh, you're young, you're able. And so you got to think about life outside of that. Um, I wanted to bring up ACAPS. Um, it's ACAPplasticsurgeons.org. They have ACAPS EDU and that they have an Instagram now. And so they're actually promoting a lot of things that haven't been promoted before, like diversity, uh, like um, outreach to different fields and, and to outreach to students from any background. And so I think that's awesome that social media is being used for good. Can, there you, are many can, you, define, um, yeah. can you define didactics as a, some jargon that we're throwing out that some people don't know, the word didactics? Oh, yeah, of course. 
didactics is a really complicated word for an online a, a lecture. That's all yeah. it is, a presentation. Yeah. Uh, presentation where you listen and you maybe get asked some questions at the end, but that, that's pretty much what it is. Um, Doctors are very good at creating you know, sometimes oral words. Sorry, I was talking over you. I said doctors are very good at, at creating complicated words for simple things. <laughs> that is the problem. Therein lies the problem. Um, and so there's fellowships, hand surgery, which is what I did, cranial facial, microsurgery. Microsurgery is where you transplant tissue from the same person to other parts of their body. And then there's cosmetic fellowships. And so I did hand surgery. And so um, to do hand surgery, you can come from any background. Uh, related to the field, which is orthopedics, plastic surgery, and general surgery. And so if you do those fields, it's a little less likely in general surgery, but you can apply and do a, a hand surgery fellowship. And it can actually be fairly competitive too. Um, and then board certification, which is a step I'm at right now. And this is once you're done training, you have to collect cases over a period of time. I have to take photos of every case, uh, get consent from the patient for the photos, um, and really, it's focused on safety. They want to make sure that the plastic surgeons that are being made are being safe. Um, and so that's about plastic surgery. Are there any um, questions from that perspective before I keep going? There's there's a ton of questions, and we'll we'll try to <laughs> obviously get to a bunch. I, I think the biggest question that I want to know that a lot of students are asking is is why hand surgery for you? Why did you why did you choose that fellowship? Yeah, it, it comes down to it's an experience. It's a shadowing experience, really. I, I was in Bolivia. It's that first slide. And there were so many children in La Paz with hand deformities, whether they had been burned, whether they were born with different hands. And there were hundreds of patients before we even got there that were screened. And so I saw a need. And that that has been my passion is I love the form and function. And I like working with kids and I like working with their parents. And so that that's that's my short answer. Cool. Okay. Yeah. And so um, uh, back to the I, I like that I made a little sub presentation, uh, but back to the regular presentation. So um, my schedule, I have clinic for two days, two days of OR. Um, I'm developing a new program here, so I'm trying to work on research as well. Um, I work hard. You can ask my wife um, and my family. I work 50 to 60 hours a week. Sometimes it's a lot more. Um, and I'm on call every four days uh, for hand surgery and cranial facial problems as well because I'm a plastic surgeon. And so the types, the kinds of patients I treat. So another question I get asked from mentees is I, I treat children. So newborns uh, up to age 18, which are really adults. Um, and then really it's a discussion with the family and the guardian. Um, it's an essential part of the care that I provide. We have uh, social workers here. We have hand therapists too. Um, and 75% uh, of the patients that I treat are Medi-Cal insured. And so really an underserved population that's quite diverse. And so I was just gonna go through some cases um, um, and they're fairly detailed, but yeah. we'll get through it. So the first one is a 12 year old boy comes to the ER. Maybe we can select somebody who can answer this. Oh yeah. So, so for everyone, there's a like raise to speak your hand kind of thing. We'll randomly pick someone. It'll it'll have you come on the stream with us. So you have to be comfortable on video. Uh, we we may have to work through some audio bugs, but make sure you you if you know how to use your technology, raise your and hand and we can get you on. This is like a question, and there's no wrong answer, right? This is what I do and how I think, and so. It's asking what, what you would do, and it's totally fine. Like I'm just I'm gonna explain it anyways. So yeah. um, this is a 12 year old boy who came into the ER. He was unrestrained, so he wasn't wearing a seatbelt. It was early in the morning, um, and it sounds like glass or a glass and part of the door actually went into his face. And so his face, the ER calls you, and they're like, his face is just split open. And so what do you want to know first? Besides the problem, besides the problem at hand. What do you want to know about this patient, about this young boy? And so you want to know basic questions. And this is the whole thing about being a doctor is who cares how much you know about the book if you can't ask the basic basic questions, which is what happened, what was the mechanism, which I explained a little bit before. And he's got an open wound, but is this patient stable? Like is is it comes down to trauma and being in an ER. 
um, the ABCs, the airway breathing circulation, are they breathing okay? Um, are, there, are there any airway issues? Um, and then is the heart stable? And so those are important things. And so the patient has an open wound, you wanna think about antibiotics. Um, you wanna know if a trauma surgeon has seen him. So you're a plastic surgeon, you're focused on the face, but a trauma surgeon is looking at this patient head to toe to make sure that there's no other serious injuries. Because the last thing you wanna do is take a patient to the OR to fix their face and they have a huge internal bleeding, for example. That patient could die uh, during the operation. And so this is what training is about. You wanna be able to answer these questions. Does he have a head injury? Is his neck injured? You're gonna be moving his head during the case. You better make sure he doesn't have a, a neck injury. Um, you wanna make sure his tetanus is up to date and does he have any other medical problems that are relevant? And so those are kind of the basic initial questions you wanna know. And so here's the kid, I blurred out a little bit of the gruesomeness, um, but he's got a laceration, I'll just describe the wound. He's got a laceration of the eyebrow and he's got a deep laceration involving the, the sidewall of his nose and going down to his lip. And you can actually see inside of his nose through there mm. and you can see bone. And so um, that's his initial injury. Let me know if anyone else comes on, I can have to ask these questions. And so yeah. what do you want to examine on this child's face? And so when I see the patient, I'm going to examine his eyes, right? I want to make sure that uh, he can open his eyes. It may be swollen, but that his vision's okay. Um, I want to examine the wound. I want to examine the muscle structure of his, if his eyebrows, if he can elevate them. Um, I want to look inside of his nose to see if there's any bleeding in the septum. And then I want to get more imaging. I want to get a CT scan, which is what the answer is for the, for the question. And let so here's you, the let me ask you a question real quick, because yeah. I know it's on a lot of students' mind. And do you ever get used to that sort of image, right? I think a lot yeah. of students who are new to this world, they see something like that, especially in a child, and they just have such a visceral reaction. And, and it, yeah. it makes you want to pull away, but obviously you have to go running towards it to, to yeah. help. Do you ever get used to that? Yeah, I think with time you do get you do get very well used to it. It's um, especially with the amount of training that I've had with seeing traumas is you're used to just bad injuries of the face. I've seen gunshot wounds to the face. Those are horrific. There, that actually there that one is really hard to get um, to ever get used to um, because you know the patient will never have a normal face again, and so. Those patients sometimes they require face transplants, um, and so yeah, there you, there are there are extensive injuries that yeah it's, it's impossible to get fully used to. But for that, I have to be the one that comes in and talks to the mother and say, "This is a bad injury. This is what the patient has. This is how we can treat that this patient to get him closer to hopefully normal." Um, but, but in some cases, that may not be possible. And so um, that's a great question. So this patient has an open, so open to air fracture of the craniofacial skeleton. You want to look at all the craniofacial skeleton. You want to make sure he doesn't have a fracture up here. Uh, you want to make sure he doesn't have significant fractures of the maxilla, of the zygoma, which is the cheekbones, of his mandible. And you can see here, uh, I'll do a little arrow, but you can see that there's a big giant crack here and a displacement. This entire piece is, is inferiorly downward displaced. Um, and going into the orbital floor. And this is actually called the nasoorbital ethmoid fracture, an NOE fracture, and the, the classification where his fracture was so bad that the attachment of the eyelid was completely off. And so it actually looked like his eye was shifting over uh, because the eyelid was off. It's called telecanthus. Wow. And so here's more pictures of the fractures. It's comminuted. Comminuted just means broken into several pieces. And so um, he was stable, didn't have any other injuries. This was isolated. And so can you, yeah. can you talk about yes. uh, the that type of CT scan? So the 3D reconstruction, can you just explain to students what yeah. that is? Yeah. So these are fine cut uh, CT scans. And actually in training, you become very used to looking at looking at it in specific planes, like taking a cut out of it in all three planes and three dimensions. And this is a 3D reconstruction of fine cuts of that CT scan. And you can actually rotate it, look it around. You can even 3D print it sometimes. It can help you with operative planning. It's cheap. Um, but yeah, this is an old, important component. Old school sur surgeons must think this is just 
plain, plain, just straight cheating. <laughs> yeah, seriously, that that's exactly right. And they've they've had CT scans for a long time, but yeah, they're like, if the flatter's off, just fix it. You know, whereas it it does help though with planning. You can figure out and see in your mind how you're going to fix it. And for me, I, I I tend to draw a lot of what I do, specifically in the hand. Yeah. Um, if I was drawing skulls all day, I'd I'd run out of time. Cool. Um, but no, that's a good question. And so the treatment options is one is that a treatment option is to do nothing. But the problem with that is the orbit. So the eye sits in the orbit and I'll, I'll go through that, the bony structure. But if there's more uh, space in the orbit, the eye can actually sink off or move off to the side. And this patient also had that tendon from the, from the eyelid that was torn. Uh, it's called the canthus. And if you weren't, if you didn't treat that, the patient would just he would have a, a pretty significant deformity. And so the other option is operative. So taking the patient to the OR and discussing the risks and benefits of this. So taking the OR, washing out the wound, the most important thing is this kid doesn't get an infection, reducing the bone, putting it back in place, putting small plates um, with screws. They're literally small titanium plates with screws. And then I'll go through some of his other aspects of his injury. And so safety is really important. And we talk a lot about this in plastic surgery because we want to make patients better. We don't want patients to have a bad outcome, uh, whether it's as significant as death, like I mentioned, not thinking about the other aspects of this child um, or, uh, or making the child worse or doing it in a way that isn't safe. And so you want to think about general anesthesia. Um, you want to tell the family that the patient will require general anesthesia. Uh, bleeding is always possible and infection the plates can have issues. And then I could, doing the surgery, I could injure his eye and the patient could become blind. That would be very unusual, but it's anything is possible when you're, when you have, you know, sharp objects around a specific area. And so the anatomy, just to go through this is super complex because there's so many layers to it. You see just the skin and most people see just the skin, but we're, as a plastic surgeon, you're thinking of all the tissue in every aspect of it in significant detail that nobody else knows. A, a perfect example is above the eye in the medial part of the eye, the central part of the eye, there's two arteries right here, right? The supratrochlear artery and the supraorbital artery. And only plastic surgeons know those arteries. And it just comes down to the level of detail because sometimes we have to use those arteries to bring tissue over that has blood supply. And so here is the uh, canthus, like I mentioned, and then there's the canulicular system for drainage of the eye is in this area where this fracture is, and this entire segment is off. And uh, I'm going to show some pictures. These are just all netters, right? So the laceration is going through here, going through some of these muscles. The most significant is the orbicularis um, oculi here, as well as the nasalis, so one of the muscles that kind of pushes the the ala, the, the the that part of the nose, and then. Uh, here is the cranial facial skeleton, um, and you just think, oh, it's just the it's just the skull bone, right? But there's there's a lot of different <laughs> just one bones. bone, <laughs> yeah, just one big bone, like you see it at the Halloween the Halloween um, the Halloween yep. store. Yep. Um, but between those bones are sutures. That's how the bone developed, and uh, the, the previously the the bone would grow from some of these sutures, and so the orbit is really complex. There's seven seven bones in here that I have to think about. Uh, there's the lacrimal bone here. There's the orbital plate of the ethmoid bone. This is part of the um, the maxillary bone here. Uh, this is part of the zygomatic bone here. This is part of the um, the sphenoid bone, and then the frontal bone. All these bones are relevant um, because you're going to be in that area. You should know exactly that this fracture is going through this part, um, through the lacrimal bone, likely, and then through the infraorbital um, uh, rim. And then the other important thing for this child is, um, remember, it goes into his nose. So I actually had to close some of the, the nasal mucosa. And importantly, the drainage of the eye, there's a little thing called a punctum here. It's so like a little, little hole um, that drains your tears. Your tears come from up here and they drain down here and they drain into your nose, which is, you know, when you cry, tears come down your nose. And this drainage system for this child was completely cut. And so that had to be repaired. Um, and so this is the cannulicular system. I actually had to put in a little silicone tube. Um, it was totally cut, so we just we, we were able to pass it through. Um, and you put a silicone tube through here, 
and through the bottom punctum and the superior punctum, and then they come out through the nose and then you tie it in the nose. And then you have to take it out at a separate surgery once everything heals. So, um, and this is just a deeper photo just showing the drainage of the eye. So there's many components to this. This is a composite injury. There's bone, there's um, periosteum that covers the bone. There's the globe, there's the orbit, there's the canthus of the tendon of the eyelid. There's the drainage system. All these things had to be considered in order to fix them. If you don't fix one of these things, he'd had permanent, he would permanently not be able to fully drain his eye. He'd always be tearing in his eye for the rest of his life. Yeah. Um, or if the canthus wasn't repaired, he would have a permanent deformity. And so I didn't include all the, the they're a little bit too graphic, but just pictures of the fractures lined up with plates. And the, the, I actually have a picture of a video of like pulling of the, of the actual tendon showing that I was putting it back in place and I sutured it back in place. But I was able to repair those things, like I mentioned, with the silicone um, stent with repairing the lacrimal, sorry, repairing the, um, the canthus with the permanent suture with plating bones and then repairing the skin. And so that's what he looked like at the end of the case. And the, this was obviously something very sharp because the skin actually wasn't very beat up, um, even though it looked pretty bad before. And so this is him uh, six months later, I think actually eight months later, um, and he's done great. And so um, luckily things went well for this child, uh, but that's a fairly complex craniofacial problem um, that had it just been closed quickly or not, if you didn't think about the orbital floor, if you didn't think about repairing that, the drainage system, th those would be significant deformities um, and functional problems for this child. So that's you're, case you're one. Getting, you're getting thousands of wows, wows, wows. That's amazing, that's <laughs> amazing. So, so good job with that. How long did that case last? I think that it was about five, four to five hours. Yeah. So long, long cases for those trauma cases. Yeah. So I'm going to ask a, a question to students. Do we want to do another case or do we want to open it up for live Q and a, and we'll, we'll give a couple seconds cause there's a little bit of a delay in me asking that, but that was a, that was an awesome case. Um, how do you deal with another question that I saw come in that I think is good while we're waiting here is, um another case everyone wants another case so we'll, we'll do that <laughs> they want the cases um cool that makes it easier um how do you deal with parents in that situation right there's multiple patients when when you have a pediatric patient yeah it it really comes down to making sure that you, you have to kind of you have to read the parent in this tra trauma situation especially like this mom was woken up. This kid was coming home early in the morning with a, with a sibling and she was woken up with this, that he's been severely injured and he's been helicoptered over to this other hospital and she had to drive a few hours to come here. And so you really have to put yourself in the position of the family member. The whole key thing with being a physician, in my opinion, and in the world in general, is to have empathy, to put yourself in the shoes of that mother. Um, she was uh, Spanish speaking only. Uh, I was able to communicate with her at, um, and I brought her aside from the injury. Like she's there, the child's face is split open. There's some gauze there, but it's full of blood. Like it's very traumatic for, for parent, for anybody, who, you know, students haven't seen it for the family who's never seen their child. I just think about they've raised this child their entire life. And this child has been perfect and beautiful. And now they're worried. First of all, the patient could die, right? that and that the patient is going to be permanently disfigured in this case the mom was more worried about him dying uh, which is very reasonable he just without wearing a seatbelt, and you know, this is a lifelong lesson for that child um and he actually gave talks at school about wearing a seatbelt, and he's even been on tv and stuff too about the importance of wearing a seatbelt. but the that that's an important thing to, to kind of get through the 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 mild, the the mother as well as that you know he's stable right now and we're going to proceed with trying to fix these things, but there's some downsides of things that could happen. And you try to anticipate and explain as much as you can. Um, and there's a, there's a balance of that too, right? Because if you say too many words, like you said, like using the word didactics, they're not going to understand, you know? And, and so you don't want to use a nasal orbital ethmoid fracture. Who cares about that word? Yeah. In the mom's eye, you have to say it in a simpler term. There's a bone where the eye sits on that is off and we have to fix it and put it back in place. Uh, even the word fracture 
is not a great word actually. I just put a, posted about this recently is fracture. Some people, many people don't know the definition of that word. And it just, you just have to say broken bone. And so uh, those are, those, that's a great question. Yeah. It's, it's funny. I, I talk to so many pre-meds and hear lots of just random things. A lot of people think there's a difference between a fracture and a broken bone. Like fracture is just like a, a little mini broken bone. That's not really a broken bone. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> like, so, yeah. yeah. And that's what the public believes. And yeah. I think, I think it's cause fracture kind of sounds like, um, almost like, uh, just something that's non-displaced, like, um, like a green stick fracture. I'm using the word fracture. Um, <laughs> just something that is kind of bent, I guess, is probably the yeah. word that I think people think of, think of it as rather than truly broken. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's get into case two and I'm going to try to bring someone in there. I, I think Melissa, are you here? Can you, can you talk? I am here. I've been here. <laughs> oh, so I, I've seen you there. I just, uh, yeah. now, now we yeah. know you're there and you can hear us and you can talk where you can answer some, some stuff in question or case two here. So this is the next case, and I'll show some pictures after too. But this child comes in, is um, 18 months old with the mom. You can see holding the hands uh, to take a picture. And uh, this child um, is missing the left index finger. And the child was born that way. And if you look closely on the middle finger here and the thumb, there's these really deep bands going into the fingers. And so the question is, what type, what type of questions would you want to ask the mom in clinic? Um, well, the first thing is I would have a little bit concern about home care because it looks like this isn't affecting their ability to survive or live. So I would want to make sure that the mom or family is willing to take on the recovery from a surgery like this. That would be my, my first angle. Yeah. Yeah. The social aspect is really important. Yeah. But this child was born this way. So are there any other questions you'd want to ask, given that the child came out of, came out into this world without an index finger? Sure. Uh, then I would start to ask um, maybe about function, you know, like how, how the child uses yeah. that hand that they have. Yeah, that is a great question. That is an awesome question. Um, perfect. And so um, th those are great initial questions. Those are the things you have to think about. And actually, I'm taking my oral board soon. Um, and those are the questions that they're, they, just like I put you on the spot, they're going to put me on the spot about cases like this. What would you do? And so uh, this is what the thumb looks just kind of from the side. Um, but the child uses the hand well. And so um, I'd want to know what I was directing a little bit more. It's, a lot of these questions sometimes are, what is the surgeon thinking? Um, but, you know, were there any issues during the pregnancy? Are there any, is there any family history of congenital hand differences? And does the child have any other medical problems? And then the functional questions are absolutely important. Um, and so this is the child's x-ray. And so if you look closely, there's an amputation at the level of the index proximal phalanx here. Um, proxim this is the proximal phalanx, the middle phalanx, and the distal phalanx. And if you look here in this band right here, look at the difference between this one on the middle finger and the ring finger. You can see that that bone is being squished, right? Mm. Um, and it's then like a, in the thumb as well, like it's part of this team, but yeah, it's like a tourniquet effect. That's yeah. exactly right. And so what this is, and this is hard to know, but what this is called, it's called amniotic band syndrome. And this is my terrible photo that I drew <laughs> a couple of years ago um, of what amniotic band syndrome is. And, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we think it is, but a lot of things that we don't know. And, and, you know, Eric, you mentioned that this is really important is, Physicians think we're, you know, we're, we're very smart, right? We're really educated, but then this isn't that smart to have the same diagnosis and come up with over 30 names for it. You know, like that's not that bright. That's not a bright way to do things because when you search for it, you won't like if you're doing research, you won't find other people's research. And and these are the things that happen in medicine and the challenges in medicine. Um, and so the name it's called many, many different things. But here we'll call we'll call it amniotic band syndrome. And so it's thought to be from amniotic bands and the development of the child where it wraps around parts of the hand, the legs, even the face. Clef, cleft lip is typically from other factors, but it can cause cleft type deformities. Um, and it's thought that that inner portion, the amnion, displaces off during pregnancy and somehow wraps around and causes an amputation and these constriction bands. 
Um, and so the incidence is not that common. It's about one in 2,000 to one in 15,000. It's more common in African American. Um, and 60% of patients can have an abnormal gestational history, which means something was different uh, during the gestation, whether the child was premature or lower birth weight or some type of trauma. But not always. Sometimes it's completely random. And it's and frequently with talking with the family, it's telling them that these are things we don't know. And so we don't think it's associated with genetics. But then I wrote here, but then there's been familial cases. So cases where maybe genetics is implied. It's been thought to be, um, it's not thought to be secondary to an infection. And usually there's multiple extremities that are affected. And so there are theories. We don't know. And that's what we have to tell families. I don't know what causes this. We don't know. But we think one is in intrinsic, which is this wordy slide, which essentially says we think that there's something in development that causes it to be to amputated. But what I just explained to you was the extrinsic theory where we think something wraps around and results in amputation. We have evidence for that, on si in, which is scientific, where children have been born with tissue, amniotic tissue wrapped around the fingers at birth. And sometimes some of the tissue can be acutely ischemic. Sorry, acutely, uh, acutely means um, where right on the spot you see, and ischemic means where there's not enough blood supply, where you have to go in and do more emergent surgery on a newborn. Um, and so there's no cases that are alike Again, some illustrations and just a lot of words, which you can ignore, but a lot of differences where the thumbs are involved and the other fingers are involved or the fingers are fused together. And so the treatment, one option is to do nothing to observe. And this child is using his hand great, um, but you want to think about how you can individualize their treatment. And you can see in this child, there's a difference. The That bone being squeezed, if we let this child continue to grow and that tissue is still compressed, that can actually cause a long-term um, difference. And the whole goal is to correct, um, correct this before um, and to, to get to it earlier on so that it doesn't become a worsening deformity. And that's another big thing in pediatric orthopedics, pediatric hand surgery, is you, you wanna prevent worsening deformity. Um, and so you wanted to discuss the risks and benefits and things that you can do. And so one treatment you can do is when you have a band that's tight and, um, this drawing will illustrate, but you can see here, this is called a Z-plasty. This is a basic principle in plastic surgery. And this is called the Z-plasty here. And see, this is the central limb. And if you draw to it, and so let's say that this is the cent this is the, the area that's contracted and it's too thin and you wanna make it longer. So if you draw two flaps, essentially, one here and then one down here um, at 60 degrees, you can incise it, which means cut it with with just the skin, cut it with a blade, elevate those flaps, and then reverse them, flip them. So this one was down here before, right? You're gonna flip it up here, and then this one, you're gonna flip it down here. And you can see this kind of illustrating the one from above is going below, and the one from below is going above. And so if you look at that central part here, it's now lengthened. And so it this gives, um, and go to the next slide, um, we've, they've done studies showing that if you do 60 degrees, it can increase the length by 75%. This is where math is important, right? Uh, as in, as pre-med pre students, right? You should, you have to be able to understand and, uh, and think about these things. because so these are real things you're doing on the human body to help. And so this is called a Z-plasty. And I, I want to think about the underlying anatomy, the extensor tendons. I don't want to hurt them during the surgery. And so here is the, the band right here. You can see it's really tight here. Another important consideration is the band goes all the way around the thumb, but if I make cuts on all the way around the thumb, there's two blood vessels that are going to the thumb. What if I, again, with not doing any harm, what if I do flaps on this side and flaps on the other side and I finish the operation like, great, the flaps look great and the finger doesn't have normal blood supply to it. That would be a disaster, right? If the child would need an amputation from your surgery. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are, those are things you want to think about. Um, and so and explain to the family before. And you can see I marked out here the dotted line. You can see that I kind of erased it because I made the angle a little bit too long. So I, I, I corrected it during the surgery to make it 60, closer to 60 degrees. And then after cutting these, um, these flaps up, I flipped them. So this flap from here went in this position and this flap went in this position. And so um, this central limb was now extended and it improved the contour. And so talking with the family, you're, you wanna say that there is constriction, 
Um, we can improve this, but it, the patient will have scars. But the hope is that as the child grows, the finger will be uh, more normal and hopefully not have a worsening deformity. And so this is after the Z-plasties were performed on both. Um, and then you got to think about what you do after, right? If you do this surgery and the child is up and playing and, and not taking care of it, uh, which they won't, right, because they're kids, uh, you got to think ahead. And so typically these patients we cast. Um, and so this is uh, healing after about uh, almost four months. And so the child's doing well. You can see that that tight band is not there as much, um, but it still looks different. It doesn't look totally normal, but luckily it was only able to, you know, I only need to do Z-plasty on one side. So the other side is, I don't think it's going to be necessary at this point. And so that's that kid. And then another thing that you can talk about is we can do things like transplanting toes to the hand um, to provide function in this case. I don't think it's indicated. Uh, you could even remove this bone if it's getting in the way um, with grasping objects, but the, the child is doing fine. But things you want to discuss with the family. Let me ask you a question that a lot of people are asking uh, and knowing just the advances in intrauterine surgeries. How common is it to catch these amniotic bands on ultrasound and, and has there been any advances in potentially going in and, and trying to fix it before the amputation takes place or the deformity takes place? Yeah. So they do get frequently found on a prenatal ultrasound, but more frequently they don't. And so I frequently talk with family members where they're very frustrated, you know, especially in this child, yes, his index is gone, but there's some children that literally have you know, almost have like one digit essentially that's there. And so th those families are particularly frustrated that it wasn't picked up before. Um, my opinion is even if by the time you pick it up, it's likely been there. You don't really know when it started wrapping and causing a deformity. I think if you see like a little dent, you potentially could go after it. But at the point where it's caused a deformity, it probably happened really early on, like when the embryo was fairly, fairly tiny. Yeah. Um, so it's tough to know exactly when it, when to intervene, but I, I don't know if that has been addressed, but there definitely are in utero things that have been addressed in the past. Yeah. Cool. But yeah, All good right. question. I'll blow through this one really quick. Okay. Um, and so case three, four year old, um, two years after a friction burn and, uh, was just had wound care, um, didn't require surgery, but over time the fingers just contracted down. And so, uh, this is how she presents to my clinic. So her middle finger is, you know, fairly bent down and there's this big tight band here of the um, middle finger. And then there's also a band of the ring finger and she can't put her hand totally flat. Oop, keep going back. And so you want to think about this patient, were there any other injuries deeper in there? So you would get an x-ray, you'd examine the patient, examine the skin, examine the tendons, think about all the tissue. And you can see here on the x-ray that the fingers bent from the scar tissue from the burn but the bones are normal. And so really this becomes a soft tissue uh, surgery. So one option is to do nothing, but the problem is as that child grows, that's just gonna get worse from the scar tissue. And so um, you wanna think about treatment for this patient. And so anatomy, 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 <laughs> talk about the bone, think about the blood vessel, think about the nerves, uh, think about the tendons, think in 3D. And for this patient, um, one of the web spaces I treated with a double opposing Z plasty, you can see a Z there and a Z there. And when you cut all these, it turns into what we call the jump, jumping man, you know, jump man. And um, once you transpose these flaps, so the, this flap up here goes into these lower ones, it actually spreads and deepens the tissue. And so this is an example of the jumping man drawn here all the limbs the same, cutting it with the skin, with the knife. Uh, we do this under tourniquet so you can see really well. And then transposing. So this flap, these two flaps up here, they actually went down here into that space. And so for this thicker band, actually, it was just all scars. So it was just a straight incision with care to not injure the nerve and the, the blood vessel. And then um, taking a little skin graft from the side of the hand and placing it right on that middle finger. And she has a pin, a metal pin to hold it while it heals. Because if, if I put a skin graft there and she starts moving it, um, it's not going to heal or take. And so this is her after a month pulled out that gear wire. Um, and then this is her with her hand flat at about three or four months 
uh, healing well. And I have to watch her. I have to see as she grows, will this come back? And it could happen. And so telling the parent about that's important. And there's the donor site from the skin graft. And so um, those are the cases I had. And so this is a quote um, that I like from a famous plastic surgeon. He who uses his hand is a laborer. He who uses his hand, his eyes, and his brain is an artisan. He who uses his hands, eyes, brain, and his heart is an artist, is a plastic surgeon. And so that's it. I have cases on, on um, I'm putting cases together here on Instagram at Valley Children's Hands. This is a, a shameless plug, um, but really it's mostly geared for families and patients. But I do think social media is a great way to explain things to families. Um, but that's it. Thank you so much. Very cool. Let me ask you a question that's come up a bunch with each of the cases is how much... I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah. How much interdisciplinary um, kind of work is there between plastic surgeons like yourself and ortho or vascular or other other specialists? Yeah, there's a ton, especially at an academic center. Um, so if somebody comes in with a low, lower extremity wound, so orthopedics is taking care of a, a patient with a, t with a lower extremity fracture, you can't leave that fracture open. So it needs tissue that has to get transplanted from one place. And so orthopedics calls us for that. And vascular surgeons that have a groin wound with an exposed graft, they call us for that. Or neurosurgeons that have a plate that's been exposed and a patient that's been irradiated, um, they need, need to transplant. Um, but really it's plastic surgeons in an academic center. Um, in the community, I would say the most interface that they have is obviously in the ER with hand problems, because um, most, not all, but most plastic surgeons take care of hand problems over time. And then um, the other big one is breast reconstruction. So the breast surgeons, which are general surgeons who take out the tumor, they work very closely with the plastic surgeons. And so you really wanna have clear communication um, so that you know what's going on with the patient. And so everything's on, everything you know will go well. Now, you had mentioned earlier that you did a hand fellowship, and I think a lot of people were confused seeing pictures of you operating on a child's face. Talk about, even as a fellowship-trained hand surgeon, talk about how you still kind of fall back to the general sometimes when on call. Yeah, it's, it really, I mean, it's just, um, it just, it comes back, you know, fairly quickly. And the, yeah, I don't see as many hand, uh, facial injuries on a regular basis, but when I'm on call, I'm a plastic surgeon. And so I have to take care of all these problems. And so a lot of it comes down to your training, comes down to um, like, I've done so many mandible fractures and, and facial fractures in residency. So I am fairly comfortable. I just, you know, you do a refresher. I always look over the anatomy again. Um, it's always in another different part of the body, right? If it's a lower leg wound, I've had to take care of several lower leg wounds recently and looking at the anatomy and making sure that you're thinking in 3D in that space again. So it definitely is a challenge for um, somebody who takes care of all the problems. I would say most plastic surgeons at some point, they decide to focus on one thing over another. Um, but like I said, there's those six books. That's a lot of different topics. And, and when you become a board certified plastic surgeon, you still have to take a test every, I think it's seven years, seven to 10 years, um, where you get tested on all these things again, to make sure that you're safe and that you're knowledgeable about how to take care of them. Even if you don't know, it's really important, actually, even if you don't know what to do about it, let's say you're fairly down the line and you don't know exactly what to do about it, you'll still remember what type of surgeon should take care of it. Does that make sense? So it's really like if there's something that is so complex that you can't take care of it, you'll know who to contact. And so keeping up with those principles, I think, is, is really important. For the over 1,800 students watching live right now, if you, you talked about empathy earlier, if you could put yourself in their shoes, thinking back to when you were in their shoes, what do you know now that you wish you knew then? That's... A really hard question because I was a super gunner always. <laughs> um, I know I, I didn't know everything. No, it's just it, it really is true. When you choose a surgery residency, it affects everybody. Like it affects your family, it affects your lifestyle, it affects even me. I have a young family, my wife who's at home right now with our three kids. My mom's there right now helping, but um, thank but you even it, more for for staying late and doing this with everyone. Yeah. 
Well, it's just an important consideration. You really do want to think about it. You want to make sure that you've asked all the questions that you've shadowed, e-shadowed, really done your due diligence to make sure that it's the right fit for you because you just, you want to enjoy life, right? You want to make sure that you like your bread and butter. I always talk about bread and butter too. Like you want to make sure that the field that you're choosing, you like their bread and butter. The boring if stuff you, that you're going to see a lot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like if you become an ear, nose and throat doctor, for example, and you don't like putting in ear tubes, you're <laughs> not going to be that happy, you know, or if you become a pediatrician and you don't like talking to the parents, like it doesn't make any sense, right? Like you, you have to, like you have to figure out what those parts of the field um, keep you happy. And so I, I think I, I did my due diligence to make sure I knew. Um, and so I, I, that's what I recommend is just shadowing and e-shadowing and not just going on YouTube, not just imagining, oh, I wanna be a plastic surgeon. That doesn't, that's not gonna help or watching a Netflix show and saying you're gonna be a plastic surgeon to all your friends. It, what really matters is real life experience. And right now we're in a different period and it's totally hard, but I love that. I mean, the plastic surgery programs are coming to the students right now. It's crazy. Like they're putting effort to try to recruit students through Zoom. And so similarly, students should be doing the same to try to get experience. So that, that's why I think this is wonderful, man. It's great. Yeah. Well, thank you again for being our first guest. I'll, I'll keep to the time so you can get back to your family. Um, so if you need to head out, <clears throat> go ahead. I'll, I'll do a nuts and bolts discussion again and answer any kind of follow-up questions for people about e-shadowing specifically. But uh, Dr. Gava's great, great first e-shadowing session. Amazing case. Hey, thanks, thanks for having me, man. Thank you so Good much. Good luck, everyone. Here. Yeah, take Thank it easy, man. Yeah, bye. bye.